Okay, so welcome to the first of three short videos looking at criminal courts. And these have specifically been designed for the AQA series of exams. Um, and in AQA, these come at the end of the uh, Unit 2 and at the end of the Criminal Liability subsection. And I have to say, I'm, I'm just going to take two or three minutes just to sort of um, give you some advice, really, if you are studying AQA Unit 2. And historically, my students have never quite done as well as they should have on the questions about criminal and civil courts. And I have some ideas about why that's the case, because it certainly shouldn't be the case that they score badly. And the reason that they shouldn't score badly is that the questions on the criminal courts are so simple. And I believe that students don't do so well on the criminal court questions because they come at the end of what is a exciting period of study. We get a chance to look at actus reus and mens rea and section 18 offences and section 20 offences and all the things that are exciting about the law. And then we start to look at criminal courts. And on the back of those exciting things, criminal courts can be slightly dull and boring. But it is here in these sorts of questions that you take your grades from B's to A's and you end up getting the UMS marks that will see you getting A's and A stars at, unit, at um, units three and four at A2. So my advice to you is please work hard at learning the elements of the criminal courts and making sure that you attain seven out of seven, five out of five for these questions. They are so simple and although they may apply to the scenario, you can still learn all of the key elements, you can commit them to memory, you can almost prepare or pre-prepare answers that you can then use in your, um, in your exams. So this is a really good opportunity for all of you studying at A-level to get some extra marks. So please don't pay lip service to the criminal courts. I'm going to do three um, videos on criminal courts. The first is the outline of the courts themselves and the appeal system. Then we're going to take a look in the second video at the procedures to court. And then thirdly, we're going to look at sentencing, different theories and um, some uh, things like mitigating and aggravating factors. So I'm going to start off in this video by looking at some terms of reference. And I'm going to introduce you to a phrase, if you haven't already heard it, um, let me just do my pen, which is known as the Court of First Instance. I'll just do the full title, the Court of First Instance. And the Court of First Instance is a court in which a case is first heard. So, three different types of offences. The first are summary offences, and summary offences are generally more minor offences. We're talking about things like motoring, and it doesn't look like motoring at all, but it is motoring and minor assaults, for instance, for instance. And to be fair, the bulk of cases are summary offences, bulk of cases that are heard in court. And summary offences, the court of first instance for a summary offence is the magistrate's court. Okay, so summary offences are only heard in the magistrate's court. And the maximum sentence is six months. On the other end of the scale, indictable offences are the most serious. And the most serious, by that we mean things like murder, rape, section 18. And the court of first instance for an indictable offence is the Crown Court. So an indictable offence can only be heard in the Crown Court. And as you'll remember from Unit 1, it's in the Crown Court that we get a judge and a jury, and in the Magistrates Court that we obviously get magistrates. Okay. Now, in the middle sits either way offences. And either way offences can be heard in either the Magistrates' Court or the Crown Court. All pre-trial work takes place in the Magistrates' Court regardless, 
But if an either way offence is slightly more serious, so imagine this is a scale, then they'll be tried in the Crown Court. So, that's your answer. If you are asked a question on the different types of offences and the courts in which they can be heard, that is your answer. There are three types of offences. The first are summary offences, which deal with minor crimes like motoring or motor or minor assaults. They are heard in the court of first instance, which is the magistrate's court, of which the maximum sentence is six months. Indictable offences are the most serious. They are heard only in Crown Court, and they cover cases or offences like murder, rape and section 18. And they are presided over by a judge and a jury. Either way offences are those that can be tried in either the Magistrates Court or the Crown Court, with the most serious either way offence being heard in the Crown Court and the least serious being heard in the Magistrates Court. But most of the pre-trial work is done in the Magistrates Court. And what we mean by either way offences that are serious or not are it's the circumstances of the case. If I was to steal I don't know, two loaves of bread and some milk, that would still be theft, but it's likely to be in the Magistrates' Court. If I was to steal two billion pounds from Bearings Bank, that's almost certainly going to be heard in the Crown Court. Still theft, they're both theft, but one might be in the Crown Court because of its serious nature. So that's your, that's your answer. So having looked at the types of offences and looked at the courts in which they're heard, let's go on to look at the routes of appeal. And in the routes of appeal, oh, this diagram, by the way, let me just put this up just in case you aren't already aware. This diagram is downloadable from the website. And if you weren't aware that there was a website that goes with all of these videos, with all of the PowerPoints and some additional material, and the material is growing on there daily, um, it can be found at www.thelawbank.co.uk. And if you go to Unit 2 AQA, you'll see um, a, a criminal courts, you'll see this diagram can be downloaded as a, as a PDF and a JPEG, I think. But if you get asked a question on the routes of appeal for cases, this is your answer. If you can take this diagram and commit this diagram to some form of coherent structure, then this will be your answer. And I'm going to start by looking at summary offences to start with. And as we know, summary offences start off in the Magistrates Court. If at the end of that court case, either the defence or the prosecution don't agree with the decision and they want to appeal that decision, then they can do so, if it's on a point of law, direct to the Queen's Bench Division of the Divisional Court. So the defence or the prosecution, on a point of law, can apply directly from the Magistrates Court to the Queen's Bench Division. The defence, however, can ask for a rehearing either against conviction or against con uh, a sentence to the Crown Court. So the defence can ask to go up one level to the Crown Court if it's on conviction or sentence. The magistrates, uh, sorry, the defence or the prosecution can go direct to the Queen's Bench Division if it's on a point of law, if they think that they've got the, the law wrong. So, for instance, let me just put that into perspective. If we are going to deal with a shoplifting case, theft, and if we go to the magistrate's court and we think that the magistrates and the clerk of the court have misinterpreted what we mean by dishonesty, They've got it wrong. They just didn't understand it. We can, or the prosecution can, go directly to the Queen's Bench Division on the point of law that is about dishonesty. If, however, the defence, if I think that I am completely innocent and the magistrates have got it wrong, I'm appealing against conviction. And I will do that to the Crown Court. Or, if I think, well, actually, I did do it, and I deserved a couple of months in prison, but actually I got, a, I got six months in prison, then I would be appealing against sentence. 
If I was going to say, I agree that I'm guilty, but I think I was punished too harshly, I am appealing against sentence. So the defence can appeal direct to the Crown Court on conviction or sentence. The defence or prosecution can appeal to the, from the Magistrates Court to the Queen's Bench Division on a point of law. If the defence still disagree with what happens at Crown Court, they can apply to appeal to the Queen's Bench Division as per normal, but only on a point of law. If the defence or the prosecution decide that at the Queen's Bench Division they didn't get the result that they think they should have, both can appeal to the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, on a point of law of general public importance. And they can only do that with leave, which means that they have to ask permission. Only on the Queen's Bench Division's permission can they appeal to the Supreme Court, and it has to be on a point of law of general public importance. On trial and indictment, so the more serious offences, we know that the course of first instance is the Crown Court. From the Crown Court, the prosecution can only appeal on a point of law. They often are called Attorney General's references, and I'm sure that you've heard case law and you've seen case law in which it's AG, AG reference number two of 1994, for instance. That will be where the Attorney General is asking the Court of Appeal, the criminal division, for a ruling on a piece of law. What they want is they want the judges, the more senior judges, to make a piece of law clear. And that has to be against the ruling of a judge in the Crown Court and only in the case of compelling new evidence. The defence can appeal with leave, so if they're given permission, against sentence or conviction on the grounds that the conviction is unsafe, if it's against conviction. So the defence or the prosecution can appeal, but for different things, from the Crown Court to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. After the Court of Appeal Criminal Division, the same system applies as it does for the Queen's Bench Division. The defence or the prosecution can apply with leave on a point of law of general public importance to the Supreme Court. Now, that is a complex diagram with lots going on. So please print it off, put it on your wall, try and commit it to memory. Because frequently there are questions about what is X's route of appeal for the offence for which you've said they are liable. So very, very easily, if you can, if you can put that into words, you will score maximum marks. I'm just going to spend a short period of time now looking at the jurisdiction of each of these um, two courts, the Magistrates Court and the, the um, Crown Court. And in terms of the Magistrates Court, the first thing to realise is that the on police applications, so I ought to add that in really, so on police application, the Magistrates Courts are responsible for issuing arrest and search warrants. So the police apply to the Magistrates and the Magistrates will issue an arrest warrant or a search warrant. They also decide on bail applications. And um, as we see here, Oscar Pistorius, don't get confused, different sort of law in South Africa, but um, and I only used him because he's only recently got bail, but the magistrates will decide whether or not a defendant will be entitled to bail. The third area that they are responsible for is for sending for trial. Sending for trial hearings, I should say. And we know that indictable cases will go straight to the Crown Court. The magistrates' court might hear a bail application for an indictable offence, it might listen to the funding of the defence, so whether or not who's going to fund for the defendant's defence, if they don't have any money, whether that's going to be a public defender, and which statements are to be used and which exhibits are to be used. They are responsible for, obviously, trying summary offences. And they are also responsible for trying either way offences, tried summarily. 
Okay, so the magistrates are responsible for arrest and search warrants, bail applications, sending for trial hearings, and in those sending for trial hearings, they might hear bail, they might hear the funding of the defendant, the use of statements in exhibits, and they are also responsible for trying summary offences and for trying either way offences that are tried summarily. The jurisdiction of the Crown Court obviously try indictable offences and some either way offences. We've already heard that they're the more serious either way offences, haven't we? The Barings Bank offences. They are responsible also for sentencing from the magistrates. So if you remember, the magistrates have a maximum of six months. If they decide, and let's say for instance it's theft, and, and theft has a maximum sentence that is greater than six months, if having heard all of the evidence, the magistrates decide six months is not enough for this defendant, they are, we found them guilty, and we think that they should go to prison for a year, they can send that case to the Crown Court to be sentenced because they don't have the power to sentence above six months. So then it will go to the Crown Court for the judge to sentence if the magistrates think that they want more than what they're entitled to give. And of course, as we've just discussed above, the Crown Court listens to appeals from the magistrates' court against, and if you remember, those are against conviction or sentence by the defence. So if the defence are appealing against conviction or sentence. Okay, so that's relatively straightforward. So again, those are, oh I can't find it now, those are the two jurisdictions you could easily be asked a question on what are the magistrates and jurists, uh, what are the magistrates and magistrates court and crown courts responsible for? That's, those will be your answers. Straightforward and simple. I uh, very, very briefly just want to make sure that you are comfortable with the types of offences. The ones that we are going to look at in Unit 2, and I'm only going to deal with Unit 2 here because this is, this is pertinent to Unit 2, but assault and battery are summary offences. They are summary offences and therefore they are tried in the magistrates. Section 47 and Section 20 are either way offences and therefore will be tried in either the Magistrates or the Crown Court. Section 18, GBH with intent, is an indictable offence only and can only be tried at the Crown Court. So I just wanted you to um, just be aware that that was the case. Um, just out of interest, actually, summary refers to the way that um, the defendant is ordered to attend court normally. So it's normally a written order delivered by post. So they are summonsed. Um, and, and that's where the word summary comes from. Either way is normally at the defendant's option. So the defendant will choose which court. It can be ordered by the magistrate. All right, so this is normally by post, or the, oh, normally by post, but can be done at the at the um, police station after charge. This is normally a defendant's request. So the defendant will be asked in the pre-trial stuff as to where they want to be heard, their either way offence to be heard in the magistrates or the Crown Court. And then the indictable could only be heard at Crown. So only at Crown, just as you're aware. And finally, in this video, I want to look at um, burden of proof. See, there, I've got this lady here carrying a burden. That's the only reason for having that, that picture up. The key reason or the key rule when it comes to the burden of proof in criminal cases is that the prosecution must prove the guilty act and the guilty mind. So the prosecution must prove the guilty act and the guilty mind. And the reason for this is that central premise or tenet of English law, which is that you are innocent until proven guilty. OK, innocent until proven guilty. So the people that have to prove you guilty are the prosecution. And they have to prove that to the satisfaction 
of the magistrates or the jury. If you remember, who are the arbiters of fact. So the prosecution have the burden of proof to demonstrate guilty mind and guilty act to the satisfaction of the magistrates or the um, jury because they are the arbiters of fact. And this is known as the burden of proof. So the burden of proof, the burden, falls on the prosecution. Okay, so the burden of proof, who has to prove it, falls to the prosecution. The standard of proof is the level to which that satisfaction has to be proved. And in criminal cases, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So the standard of proof that the prosecution have to demonstrate to the magistrate or the jury in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt. If they cannot do that, then there's a acquittal. And I generally tell my students beyond a reasonable doubt is about 99%. It's got to be almost absolutely certain. OK, so there we go. I'm hoping that was a relatively short introduction. And it is so easy. It is so easy and straightforward. Commit them to memory, learn them and understand them, and you will very, very quickly get your full marks in these types of questions.